Hello, it's Randy Rhodes. Here's a clip from our show and go to randyrhodes.com for the whole thing and a podcast. Buy a stinking podcast. Mary had a little man, man, man. The fault. We believe that all men are created equal. To the magnificent mosaic that is America. From radio beacon to radio beacon. I have a dream. Change has come to America. Knock, knock. Who's there? It's a figment of your imagination. Randy Rhodes Show. Turn up your mind. It's Friday, you bastard. Da, 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 da. I hope you enjoyed that because that is probably the most fun we will have on a freaking Friday, you bastard. Because as I've been tweeting, the um, wife, Rakia uh, Scott, has released her cell phone video uh, in, an, in, a, in a plea to the uh, Charlotte, uh, you know, police department to release their video. Now, Rakia obviously was doing her video on a cell phone. Did you even know that she was there when her husband was shot? I had no idea until this, until she released the video. It turns out she's standing right there on the sidewalk. Right there on the sidewalk with the passenger door open filming this encounter with the police which means that uh mr keith scott was still in the car he was still in the car and she was pleading for him to get out of the car as they asked him to uh and they were going to break the window of the uh vehicle if he didn't get out of the car which just blows my mind because the passenger door is open the whole freaking time not that the media is noticing any of these things no they're not noticing anything uh and what you can hear her say is he's he doesn't have a gun he's not going to hurt you he has a tbi i actually heard a pundit on cnn somebody uh, for the police unions somebody pro uh, pro whatever happened here pro whatever it is <laughs> okay say well then she says something about a tvi and i don't even know what that is so let me let you hear it in case you haven't heard it yet uh so that you can um Listen to the audio portion, which is, I think, much more valuable, actually, than the video because she's taking this off an iPhone. She's off to the side, and you can't see uh, you can't see Mr. Scott. You can't see the police officers. You can't see anything. So in this case, it's very important to use your other sense, your sense of hearing, and listen to the exchange. Don't shoot him. Don't shoot him. He has no weapon. He has no weapon. Don't shoot him. Don't shoot him. Don't shoot him. He didn't do anything. He doesn't have a gun. He has a TBI. He's not going to do anything to you guys. He just took his medicine. Keith, don't let them break the windows. Come on out the car. So he's still in the car. Keith, don't do it. Keith, get out the car. Get out. Keith, Keith, don't you do it. Don't you do it. Keith, 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 don't you do it. Did you shoot him? Did you shoot him? Did you shoot him? He better not be dead. He better not be dead. I know that much. I know that much. He better not be dead. I'm not going to come near you. I'm going to record, though. I'm not coming near you. I'm going to record, though. He better be alive because I'm coming. You better. <sighs> so everything that we've been told so far about him, uh, you know, standing there with a gun is untrue. His wife is standing on the sidewalk making, you know, uh, the police probably told her to get out and get on the sidewalk. And her husband has a traumatic brain injury, uh, doesn't want to get out of the car for whatever reason. I mean, he's got a traumatic brain injury. He was in some car wreck and he has a traumatic brain injury. And so he's a little slower to respond. And this whole thing escalates in what was that tape? A minute and 12 seconds. He's still in the car. He's still sitting in the car. And they're saying, drop the gun, drop the gun, drop the gun. How do you drop a gun if you're sitting in a car? I don't even understand it. It's an open carry state anyway. But okay, 
And she's standing on the sidewalk. The passenger side door is open, but they're on the driver's side. The police are. And she's saying, Keith, get out of the car. Keith, get out of the car. And telling the cops, don't you do it. Don't you do it. He doesn't have a gun. He doesn't have a weapon. He's not going to hurt you. And they freaking shoot the guy as soon as he does get out of the car. Now, what we do know from the, the police officers, what we do know from the uh, from the city, the Charlotte police yesterday said they had seen the dash cam. This is not the dash cam video. This is the video that she took, that Rakia Scott took on her cell phone, okay? This is her amateur, you know, un, uncut, unredacted, unmessed with, just straight off of the, the phone video. But the dash cam video and the... You know, first we were told, th- this is why this is so upsetting, because the first lie that we were told was there was no body cameras, that Charlotte doesn't use body cameras, therefore don't expect to see a video. Then they said, well, there is dash cam video. Then they said, oh, well, there is also, uh, you know, vest video, because they do wear body cams in Charlotte. Now they say they won't release the tape. Now you look at the difference between here and Tulsa. Tulsa, not only did you get tape, you got helicopter tape, you got tape on the ground, you got, uh, you know, vest. By the way, we're going to talk about little Betty Shelby out there in Tulsa. She has a little uh, difficulty following the law herself, the one who shot Mr. Crutcher. Okay, she's got a little uh, anger issue going on there. Little problem, couple of, uh, you know, uh, excessive forces, uh, ex- excessive use of force complaints against, against her, couple of restraining orders apply, you know, applied for against her. Kind of freaking fascinating. Then we'll take a bigger look at what the hell is wrong with the police, okay? Because I'm so sick of looking at what is wrong with African-American communities and Donald Trump saying that they are in the worst shape that they've ever, 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 ever been. Apparently he wasn't alive during slavery, Jim Crow, or uh, any of the lynchings. You know, apparently he doesn't remember any of this. But anyway, uh, so here, here's the interesting part. Yesterday when the police actually viewed the tape with the family, the dash cam video and the body cam, uh, the, the body cameras, he said that that tape left, uh, left him not knowing what happened either. What I can tell you that I saw, and I was very clear when I talked about this before, is the the video does not give me absolute definitive um, visual evidence that um, that would confirm that a person is pointing a gun. I did not see that in the videos that I've reviewed. So uh, what I can tell you, though, is when taken in the totality of all the other evidence, it supports what we've heard in the version of the truth that we gave about the circumstances that happened that led to the death of Mr. Scott. It does not support anything that you told us because the video that she has, the video that she has, has her telling the police her husband is harmless. Having the, the, the video that she showed us shows her telling the police he's got a traumatic brain injury. The video that she showed shows her husband is still sitting in the car, in the car as they're screaming, drop the gun, drop the gun, drop the gun. What are they referring to? He's sitting in the freaking car. And the video also now shows now we know uh, because the family has spoken out. They were shown the dash cam video. They were shown the body cam video. And they say what they saw was their husband, father, son. They say they saw him walking backwards with his hands down by his sides. Now, I got a couple questions for you. First one is, why don't you release the video? And the second question is, are police supposed to shoot to kill when a guy's wife is screaming, he won't hurt you, he's got a traumatic brain injury, you know, uh, Keith, get out of the car, Keith, get out of the car, and yelling at the cops, don't you do it, don't you do it, oh my God, he better effing be alive, he better be alive, did you just shoot him? Are they supposed to shoot to kill that man? Or are they supposed to shoot to disable him if they feel 
that this guy with a traumatic brain injury who's sitting in his car and won't get out because his wife is saying he just took his medicine, he's sitting in the car, he's got a traumatic brain injury, he doesn't have a weapon, he's not going to hurt you. Are they supposed to, I don't know, if they feel the need to shoot him and they say he's standing up and walking backwards with his hands at the side, can you not shoot him in the in the ankle? Can you not shoot him in the in the thigh? Can you not shoot him in the in the hand? Do you have to shoot him to kill him? I'm not sure who's instructing shoot to kill men with traumatic brain injuries sitting in the car waiting to pick up their kids from school with their wife there standing on the sidewalk allowing you to approach the husband who was not the subject of your duty that day. In fact, you were supposed to be serving a warrant on somebody completely else. I don't even know why they stopped him, do you? I don't even know why they had any interest in this man. Nobody has told me why he was interesting. Why he was a person of interest in the first place. But you want to take things in totality? Fine. Let's take it all in totality. Let's take all of these unarmed African-American men, all of these men who had absolutely no intention of hurting anybody, who ended up dead by police in totality. For a commercial-free, on-demand, whenever, wherever listening experience, visit randyrhodes.com for your personal premium podcast today. I am so excited to announce that ITM Trading is back to sponsor our new show. ITM Trading is a precious metals company that was a very loyal sponsor of mine for years and years, and our reunion couldn't have happened at a better time. 2016's been great for me and for gold. Did you know that gold outperformed the Dow this year by over three times? Since January, the Dow Jones is up 8% and gold is up over 26%. Some of the wealthiest and most powerful people in the country are diversifying huge sums of money into gold because they know diversification is the key. And maybe it's time for you to get diversified too. It's time to talk to my friends at ITM Trading about gold and how it can help you. Call them at one 888 gold they've been in business for over 20 years they have an a plus rating from the better business bureau and if you'd like to know how to diversify with gold call itm trading at one triple eight own gold and ask for a free gold kit one triple eight own gold one triple eight o w n g o l d i'm rick smith and this is labor history in two on this day in labor history the year was 1906 that was the day that dr harriet louise hardy was born in arlington massachusetts she pursued a career in medicine driven by personal family tragedy she lost her father to pneumonia when she was only four years old she also lost a baby brother to the 1918 influenza outbreak Dr. Hardy became an early leader in the field of occupational medicine. She was also the first woman to become a full professor at Harvard Medical School. Dr. Hardy began her career in occupational medicine when she began to investigate the causes of illness among workers making fluorescent lights in factories north of Boston. Many of these workers were women. Dr. Hardy researched the cases of beryliosis in Lynn and Salem, Massachusetts. The metal beryllium is used in the making of the lights. Inhaling dust or fumes of the metal can be deadly, but symptoms often do not begin to show up until years after exposure. Symptoms include shortness of breath, coughing, and scarred lungs. Dr. Hardy developed the National Beryllium Registry. It was one of the first registries of its kind to track the impact of a chronic health disorder. Her research helped lead to safety measures in the handling of this dangerous metal. Dr. Hardy also worked with unions, including the Oil, Chemical, and Atomic Workers Union and the United Mine Workers to identify and address workplace health hazards. These included substances like lead, mercury, anthrax, and asbestos. She wrote a textbook on the subject of industrial toxicology with another pioneer in the field of occupational health, Dr. Alice Hamilton. Dr. Hardy helped to forge new ground in making job sites more safe and healthy for workers. Labor History in Two brought to you by the Illinois Labor History Society and The Rick Smith Show. To speak to Randy, call now, you bastards. 
Hello, hello. Randy Rhodes. Randy Rhodes. Air Force. Believe me. Don't shoot him. Don't shoot him. He has no weapon. He has no weapon. Don't shoot him. Don't shoot him. Don't shoot him. He didn't do anything. He doesn't have a gun. He has a TBI. He's not going to do anything to you guys. He just took his medicine. Keith, don't let them break the windows. Come on out the car. Come on out the car. Get out of the car. He doesn't have a weapon. He's got a traumatic brain injury. He's not going to hurt you. And then they shoot him. I, listen, what's wrong with our police? What is actually wrong? This is this is really going to make you a little sick. I think. I think this um, this is it, this this should, this should make you uh, you know a little sick, a little nauseous. I don't care. You know, you're listening. You're African American. You're Latino. You're white. You're Jewish. You're 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 a white supremacist. Uh, you know, we're on to you. Okay, this this should make you like really sick. Go to the Randy Ro- go to randyroads.com first of all. And then go to the homework section in the drop down menu. Just click on the homework section. You'll see there, there's an FBI report. Okay, I don't make this crap up. There's an FBI report, but it's dated 2006. And it was the FBI being very, very concerned that white supremacists were joining the police forces around America. Now, when you look at 2008, the FBI report is only 2006 and it's highly redacted. So I couldn't really understand how prevalent or 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 ominous or you know how how you know bad was this problem how deeply had uh white supremacists infiltrated our law enforcement uh you know departments and so i started googling around to see if i could find anything more current or if i could find any cases where white supremacists were identified within police forces and uh, were somehow punished and the answer is oh yeah it's out there. Nobody's ever bothered to put it all together for you. And so that's kind of what I thought we should do here today. Because it's just like I said, you've got good police officers who are serving bes- beside these wackadoodles, these crazy people who apparently got a memo somewhere along the line that said, would you like to carry a gun, uh, harass blacks and get paid for it? But wait, there's more. Nothing will happen to you because the chief of police is now the district attorney. Oh, yeah. It's bad. It's freaking bad. So let's look at some of the stats I was able to find. Um, this, a federal court found that members of the Los Angeles Sheriff's, Sheriff's Department... Los Angeles. This is LAPD. Again, Mark Furman. You remember the cross-examination of of, of Mark Furman by F. Lee Bailey? You know that thing took three days? I don't know if you remember that. It was a three-day thing. That's in my book, too. (laughs) Yes, that's in my book, too, which you can't buy because we have 6,100 subscribers on the YouTube page. We've got to get to 10,000. Yeah, we have to get to 10,000 in order to get customer service from YouTube. That's number one. And number two, the publishers who might publish the book, they want to see the goods. And for them, the goods are, how many Twitter followers do I have? How many Facebook people are following me? How many times do those videos get watched? And how many subscribers are there on the uh, YouTube uh, uh, video page? So, yeah, we broke 5,000, which was great. Now we're up to 6,100. Got to get to 10,000 so I can get me some customer service from YouTube and figure out what the hell I'm doing with these things. Because not completely clear. Not completely clear. I do know this. Trump ads show up on my YouTube Can't get customer service unless I get to 10,000 subscribers. Betcha it'll take more than 46 days. (laughs) It's YouTube. But let's go back. Three days of cross-examination by F. Lee Bailey to Mark Furman from the LAPD during the OJ trial, where they put the police on trial. And herein is the reason. 
because Mark Furman was a racist police officer who was caught on tape saying that he liked to take black kids, treat them as gang members, and beat the crap out of them for fun. This was a fun Friday, Saturday night thing for him. Took three days to get them, to get him to admit this. And he really never did, but they had the tape. Because Mark Furman was helping a screenwriter write a screenplay about female police. And Mark Furman was telling these little anecdotes uh, about what goes on in the LAPD. That was in the 90s. Let's go to 2000 and uh, let's go to the, the aughts, okay? Beginning in 2006, the FBI starts to look into white supremacists infiltrating the police. Several key events preceded this report. One of them was a federal court had found that the members of the LA Police uh, Sheriff's Department formed a neo-Nazi gang and habitually terrorized the black community. And then they saw the same thing in Chicago. Chicago had fired a guy named John Burge. Now, let me tell you, John Burge did go to jail, but John Burge is out of jail. Now, talking about these guys, every time I research them and find out they're out of jail, scares the bejesus out of me. So please, subscribe to my YouTube page. If I'm going to go, I'd like to go with a million subscribers. Just would. But the Chicago uh, Police Department fired this guy, John Burge. He was a detective. He was also uh, tied to the Ku Klux Klan. He had tortured over a very long career, a hundred black male suspects. I'll tell you about what he did, but let me continue with the compilation, okay? Then we see the mayor of Cleveland, the mayor of Cleveland, he discovers that many of the city police locker rooms were infested with white power graffiti. And then years later, the Texas Sheriff's Department discovered two of its deputies were actually recruiters for the Ku Klux Klan. Hey, would you like to carry a gun, harass black people, and get to kill them, torture them, and, and, and get paid for it? But wait, there's more! You'll never get prosecuted! Because police go to a secret grand jury where the ex-police chief is now the district attorney! Okay, let's move on. The FBI issued a warning that white, supremac uh, right, white supremacy extremism in the United States increased... After that report, that report was 2006. The warning came in 2008. This particular warning came to look at the years 2008 to 2014. Let's see, what happened in 2008? Mm, that might have increased hostility, resentment, racism, a feeling that you were losing ground as a white person. Oh, that's right. You're a genius. Thank you. Yes, the FBI issued a warning that said from 2008 to 2014, white supremacy extremism in the United States increased exponentially. The number of white supremacist groups reportedly grew from 149 to over 1,000 with no apparent abatement in their infiltration of law enforcement. That is a quote. So, in 2015, because this report goes from 8 to 14, this is a newspaper article I found Googling around in 2015. Seven San Francisco law enforcement officers were suspended after an investigation showed they exchanged numerous white power communications laden with remarks about, quote, lynching African Americans and burning crosses. Three reputed Klan members that served as correction officers were arrested for conspiring to murder a black inmate and at least four Fort Lauderdale police officers, welcome to Florida, were fired after an investigation that found that the officers fantasized almost endlessly, sort of an Anthony Weiner situation about sexting. They couldn't stop fantasizing about killing black suspects. Now, here's a little uh, uh, piece of information for you. The United States, you know, we've told you before, they don't track the killing of unarmed black men by police. 
It's voluntary. Well, guess what else we don't track? We don't publicly track white supremacists. You have to rely on the FBI's little secret report that's completely redacted. So you can't really see where and who they're looking at. Or you have to go to the uh, Southern Poverty Law Center or to, uh, you know, uh, people that watch uh, hate crimes in the United States or to the Guardian that has begun to count for us how many unarmed black men have been killed in the United States by police in a giant report called The Counted. This is the only way that we get stats, which is why you have these police officers who are so confident when they say, you can't prove racism in the police forces. You can't show me data that says that police officers shoot unarmed black men at any kind of a rate over white unarmed men. They feel confident saying that because they know that there's, there, well, there hasn't been previously data, but there is now. Because some police uh, uh, departments are voluntarily reporting to the Guardian's The Counted uh, project. Because there are good police officers out there who despise having to serve next to these people. Anyway, we don't publicly track white supremacists. So the full range of the infiltration into the police force is, is a little murky. It's a little hard. So what you got to do is you got to look for specific examples, right? Now, I will tell you that the targets for these uh, groups, as you know, are black and Jewish Americans. We are the foremost targets of white supremacists. And recent attacks in Nevada, Wisconsin, Arizona, Kansas, and North Carolina now show us that it's other non-whites as well. The uh, amount of hate crimes against Muslim Americans has increased exponentially as well. Um, and so you have uh, Latinos also who are now more vulnerable since Trump started running. But uh, you have um, all kinds of religious and social minorities like the Sikh temple. Remember the Sikhs? The Sikhs are not Muslim. But, uh, you know, idiots in the country, ignorant, uh, you know, white supremacists don't know the difference. A turban is a turban is a turban is a turban is a yarmulke. Okay, the last several years alone, white supremacists have murdered law enforcement officers. So when they start quoting these stats about officers killed, here's the numbers for this. This is really, really sick. The white supremacists have uh, have murdered law enforcement officers in Arkansas, Nevada, and Wisconsin. 511 law enforcement officers killed during felony incidents from 2004 to 2013 were killed by white citizens. 511 were killed by white citizens from 2004 to 13. Of the citizens stopped by law enforcement officers in New York City and Chicago, white citizens were more likely to be found with guns and drugs. Now, white supremacists have a penchant for not only guns and violence, but they also have a penchant for gun and drug trafficking. This is how the guns end up in Chicago. They are trafficked into Chicago from Indiana. Mike Pence's Indiana. And so the findings seem to indicate that the network of white supremacists is just as deadly and far-reaching here in the United States, if not more so, than foreign-born terrorists. Well, foreign-born, I mean, it's not even, a, it's a no-brainer. Foreign-born terrorists have, have done basically, uh, you know, uh, two, three attacks in this country. Everybody else was an American citizen. But... When you look at uh, you know terrorism that's done by uh, uh, that's done in the name of uh, uh, of mo uh, Muslim ideology or foreign ideology, and you compare it to the terrorism that's going on in the United States by white supremacists, it's not even a contest. And that's why the FBI has said that their biggest concern in the United States is not foreign terrorism, not foreign ideologies. It's homegrown. It's homegrown, it's gangs, it's uh, white gangs, it's white supremacists, it's Ku Klux Klan, it's the neo-Nazis, it's the white supremacists. So here we have information 
that brings to light the threat, the real threat, the dark feature of the American experience that we thought was extinct and was relegated to movies from the black and white era called Birth of a Nation or even the, col- you know, the uh, uh, in color, in living color, you know, uh, uh, um, Mississippi burning. No, no. This is going on right here today in real time. Now, I want to tell you the story of Mr. Burge. Remember I said I, I, I mentioned him? Okay, he's out of jail. This man, Mr. Burge, he was a Chicago police officer. He now lives here in Florida, which is what's creeping me out. Okay? But he was a, a former Chicago cop, and he tortured victims for decades. His era was the 70s and the 80s. He was released from prison, and uh, he, he did three and a half years in prison, and not for torturing people. No, no, no. Remember, he was torturing people during the 70s and the 80s. He was actually fired in 1993, but nobody heard his case. He wasn't prosecuted until 2006. In 2006, the only reason he was prosecuted is because the statute of limitations on his torture crimes had expired. But he had given testimony when asked about the torturing, and he lied to the FBI. And so in 2006, they put him on trial for perjury, for lying to the FBI. And that's all they could get him on, because the statute of limitations had expired on the people that he had tortured. Now, how did he torture them? He would take cattle prods. When he would bring somebody in and he would look for somebody to confess, because it's so much cheaper when you confess than it is when you plead not guilty, and remain not guilty so he would apply torture principles to people that he brought in like cattle prods to the genitals and beating victims with phone books and chairs and things like that so finally in 2006 he was convicted of lying about his involvement in the torture ring and it was a ring And not in criminal court either. He lied in a civil case. And this is what I'm telling you. This is what I was telling you yesterday. There's something wrong with the criminal justice system, as we all know. Criminal. As opposed to civil. Okay? Civil is money damages. Criminal is penalties and punishment for the individual who committed a crime. Like Mr. Burge. But it seems to me that it doesn't, nothing happens until you get into civil court, right? In civil court, this is where the victims' families from all these shootings and all these murders uh, are getting compensated. They're cutting checks for black lives, you know, in civil court. In civil court, they're finding, you know, guilt. In civil court, they're finding that somebody needs to be held accountable for their actions to the tune of $5 million, $6 million, $6.5 million to the families of the father, brother, son who will never be with us again. Ever. They're gone forever. But the criminal court seems to fail miserably at convicting those same people. And my theory is because the prosecutors rely on the police so heavily to prosecute people they want prosecuted. And in fact, some of these police chiefs have gone to law school and now become the district attorney. And that when a police officer is accused of of criminal wrongdoing, A secret grand jury is convened, the grand jury, where you can get a ham sandwich indicted. Remember that? Oh, the 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 bar of of proof is so low in a grand jury that you can indict a ham sandwich. Well, these police officers aren't being indicted. And I have told you, Tamir Rice's grand jury excused the police officer the same day Tamir Rice was shot and killed. But in civil court, you're finding people accountable, at least. So we know where the problem is, and we know the problem is in the criminal court system. Mr. Burge was convicted for his torture ring in civil court for perjury in a civil case. Okay, and that's when they were able to take him to criminal court. And so in the criminal court, he was sentenced to four and a half years in prison for perjury, but he served less than four years, and he was released October 2nd, 2014. And he now lives in Florida. And he still draws a pension 
from his time on the Chicago in the Chicago police. He gets four thousand dollars a month from his police pension from the city of Chicago. His victims have never seen restitution because of the statute of limitations. But let me tell you a couple of guys that went to jail because of Mr. Burge. Stanley Rice. Stanley Rice was convicted of rape. He was sentenced to 100 years in prison in 1982. All these years later, December 11th, 2013, he was released after serving more than 30 years when a Cook County judge, Chicago, overturned his conviction based on Mr. Burge's torture of him and gave him a new trial. He was innocent. He has claimed for decades while he was serving his 30 years that he was beaten and coerced into confessing to this rape by the Chicago police, Area 2 detectives working for Lieutenant John Burge. And it turns out he was correct, but he served 30 years. 1973, I tell you, his era was 70s to the 80s. Wasn't fired till 1993, this Burge dude. Wasn't tried till 2006 and only for perjury and he's out. But um, Anthony Holmes, who was also one of Burge's earliest victims, he remembered that Mr. Burge had told him while suffocating him with a plastic bag over his head in order to get a confession from him for something he didn't do, don't bite through that bag. And he called him, you know, the N-word over and over again. Also, uh, Anthony Holmes spent 30 years in prison. He confessed to the torture. Uh, he, he confessed during the 1973 torture. Uh, to killing to, to killing somebody uh, that he didn't, uh, it was a crime he didn't do. And when Mr. Burge finally, finally went to jail for perjury, Anthony Holmes was able to say, you know, he, he said, I, I, I'm trying to hold back my emotions because I don't want people to see me like this. My family's been through a lot. He's out now too. He, he, he didn't do it. It was a coerced confession, a, a, an untruthful coerced confession. And he said, now I need some help. He said, you know, Mr. Burgess gets, uh, you know, uh, his, his pension, $4,000 a month. He said, I've been in prison for 30 years. I get out, I get nothing. And, I, and now I'm told I, I should, you know, form a life. I should just go on with my business. The cost to the city of Chicago for Mr. Burgess' actions has resulted in more than $96 million in costs for the city. Now, some victims have gotten settlements, but Mr. Holmes, Anthony Holmes, and Mr. Rice, never. They're still waiting. Mr. Holmes is now 70 years old, having spent 30 years of his life in prison. And when they released Mr. Burge, he was interviewed and he said he got to go through some of the things that we went through. He's got to. At least he's got a pension. We come out, we get nothing. So that was uh, one guy in Chicago. Okay. Here's the story of the San Francisco police officers. This is in the New York Times, and it's dated April 5th, 2015. San Francisco's police chief, police chief said Friday that he had moved to dismiss seven officers who sent or received text messages that spoke of lynching African Americans and burning crosses. Greg Soar, the police chief, said Friday that the texts sent by the officers in 2011 and 12, okay, this, this, this is a report from, this is a, a newspaper article from 2015. Swift justice, right? Justice delayed is justice denied. All right. So the texts were being sent in 2011 and 12, quote, and the police chief said, are of such despicable thinking that those responsible clearly fall below the minimum standards required to be a police officer. This is four years later. They're still on the force, right? Still policing the community, uh, texting each other. Okay. The messages said things like white power and included denigrating comments about homosexuals and Mexicans and Filipinos and were sent or received by as many as 14 officers in the department, the police chief said. Now, the officials have acknowledged that the texts have shaken confidence in the police department, which is responsible for public safety in a city that has long prided itself on inclusiveness and open mindedness, which is exactly what Charlotte 
thinks of itself. And, and Charlotte has come a long way. Charlotte, ever since the, the banking boom moved into Charlotte and Raleigh, you know, that, that, that is a really middle class, uh, you know, one of the biggest, uh, you know, most important cities in, in the United States now. Charlotte has come a long way. And they think of themselves this way, too. So it's not to denigrate Charlotte when we talk about the Charlotte story. It's to show you what's happened to the police force that you may not want to have happen to your police force. And if it could happen in San Francisco and Los Angeles and Chicago... And Donald Trump and his ilk like to point to the democratic rule, which we know is bullshit. Then let's look to the police departments and see what's happened to these police departments who are inflicting this kind of damage in these kinds of communities. And guess what you find? Yeah, white supremacists being recruited and paid and protected and coddled and look who are doing all this the lawyers for the officers they say the texts don't represent their client's opinion they were texting these horrible white supremacist memes and 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 messages to blow off steam now i must tell you that there have been according to the public defender in san francisco at least 1,000 other cases in San Francisco of police officers that must be investigated. But he's a public defender. A thousand cases he's found. All things Randy at randyroads.com. Go, go for launch. Speaking truth to power, the Randy Rhodes Show. This is Tara Devlin, a.k.a. Tara Dactyl from RepublicanDirtyTricks.com on the Progressive Voices channel on TuneIn. And this is my two-minute tirade. Like Giuliani said, Republicans excel at keeping us safe. Except for that one time, I suppose. But they assure us they would have moved heaven and earth to prevent the September 11 terrorist attacks if they knew they were coming. As for taking care of those first responders living and dying because of the illnesses that stem from that day, they won't lift a damn finger. Oh, but they'll make a lot of words come out of their mouths praising the heroes. But don't be fooled, because dozens of first responders with various crippling illnesses and injuries, rather than focusing on their health without the stress of wondering whether they can afford treatments that help keep them alive, had to spend much of last year traveling to Washington to try and persuade Republicans to pass a new 9-11 health care law before the old one expired. Republicans could have just passed the bill, but they made the people they call heroes take time out of whatever time they have left to beg these Republican bastards not to be the unconscionable ghouls they are. But like my father always said, we can only expect grunts from pigs. No offense to pigs, frankly, because these Republicans needed to use the first responders they call heroes like hostages to push their abhorrent agenda. While words like hero came out of their mouth, Republicans basically said, if you don't give us the thing we want, like lifting an oil export ban, we're gonna let the heroes die. So remember that whenever you hear a Republican lecturing us on patriotism, because when it comes to Republican hypocrisy, we must never forget. This is Tara Devlin from RepublicanDirtyTricks.com. Go there and find links to my Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram communities, and keep listening for two-minute tirades on demand on the Progressive Voices app or on the Progressive Voices channel on TuneIn. We stick together, we win. When? This is why you work so hard to pay the mortgage. Because home is more than four walls and a roof. It's that porch swing on a summer night. It's pajamas with feet and everybody over for Sunday dinner. And that old stuffed chair in the living room you just can't get rid of. This is why you work a second job. This is why you learn to fix things yourself so you could save on repairs. Because home is your place, your memories, your family sleeping in their own beds at night. And that is why we want to help. We are making home affordable, a free government resource that can make paying the mortgage easier. And now even more options are available. Call 888-995-HOPE today. That's 888-995-HOPE. Or visit makinghomeaffordable.gov. Good night, Mama. 
This is why. Brought to you by the U.S. Treasury, HUD, and the Ad Council. The Randy Roach Show is brought to you by our partners at ITM Trading. Call them at one own gold and ask for a free gold kit. one o w n g o l d. The Randy Rhodes Show is live on RandyRhodes.com and the free Progressive Voices app for Android and iOS. Visit the App Store or ProgressiveVoices.com now. Uh, most of the people who are, what they say, crossing over supporting Mr. Trump are all older. I think they're over 60 for the most part. Any African Americans? Well, that's a smaller percentage of our population, and I don't think that many. I'm sure there were some, but I don't know if they were voting. I mean, I'm talking about voters. Oh, my God, that's Kathy Miller, who uh, resigned yesterday. Uh, This is just the mentality of a Trump supporter. They're older, they're white, and they believe that even in Youngstown, Ohio, where she was, they believe that black people don't vote, they're stupid, they're undereducated, and that there's very few of them in her community because she's so segregated. Her life is so segregated away from people in her, because Youngstown is almost 50-50 black and white. So it's a steel community that has been decimated by the moving of the uh, steel mills. But she has no idea. This is what a Trump supporter is. Anyway, the public defender, as I was telling you, in San Francisco said there are at least a thousand cases that need to be reviewed of white supremacists within the San Francisco police force sending white power and white supremacy uh, texts and uh, graffiti on the lockers and, you know, uh, talking about wanting to, you know, uh, beat the crap out of black people a la Mark Furman 1995. I mean, you would think, but oh no, this all started again as soon as we elected a black president, which is exactly what my African-American and listeners, especially the women, uh, were telling me would happen when Barack Obama got the nomination, not even when he was sworn in. The day he was sworn in, the white Senate was was plotting and planning how to undo him, how to ruin his presidency. Mitch McConnell from Kentucky, the head of the whole thing, Jim DeMint, all plotting and planning how never, ever, ever to support Obama's efforts in any aspect of governing. Nothing. Anything he wanted, they'd be against. Anything at all. They were going to ruin his presidency from the minute he... And then it degenerated into white supremacist behaviors, uh, not just the, uh, the proliferation of guns, not just... And this ties back to the story that all these millions of guns in the country are owned by about 3% of the population. We have a terrorism problem in this country, and it isn't Islamic. It's very much white, very much this bizarre distortion of Christianity, this mutation of Christianity. It is not the Christian religion. It is just like uh, uh, the bastardized version of that uh, ISIS has of, uh, you know, uh, Islam. These people are calling for the same damn thing. They want a Christian country, but their version of Christianity, their distorted, ridiculous, bent, ill-informed, ill-equipped uh, Christian law replacing uh, uh, the law of man. And they're infiltrating law enforcement in order to do this. So here you have Mr. Adachi, Jeff Adachi, the San Francisco public defender, who says there are at least a thousand cases that need to be investigated. He, here's his quote. He said the character, characterization of these hateful statements as innocent banter is dead wrong. This casual dehumanization leads to real-life suffering and injustice. It foments a toxic environment in which citizens fear and distrust the police, brutality reigns, and good officers are less effective. Mr. Adashi called for the city to require all officers to undergo racial bias training and require those who witness a colleague engaging in racial bias to report it to supervisors or face discipline. He said training and and reinforcement is the only way to ensure that racial bias by police doesn't hurt our citizenry. Okay, that sounds, you know, kind of trite when you realize there are a thousand cases that need to be investigated of white supremacists infiltrating the police department in freaking San Francisco. But here's the kicker. The district attorney, George Gascon, the district attorney was previously the police chief. And he said what he'll do is start a task force to look into it. He'll start a task force and he'll investigate potential misconduct. He won't review these 1,000 cases that the public defender says he needs to review. Oh, no. 
He'll start anew, create some task force, and he'll um, look at, you know, potential misconduct. Now, the officers that were involved in this texting scandal, they had been on the force for as long as 23 years, and they had worked in mostly minority neighborhoods. They found the texts in 2015, only in 2015. It was part of a federal corruption case against a sergeant, an officer, who had sent a lot of these messages. He was a 20-year veteran. He was convicted in December 2014 of stealing money and property from suspects. He got 41 months in prison. It was his texts that they found. The Randy Rhodes Air Force. The Randy Rhodes Show is live on RandyRhodes.com and the free Progressive Voices app for Android and iOS. Visit the App Store or ProgressiveVoices.com now. Your phone can be a source for progressive power. Yes, it can. Credo Mobile is a progressive phone company. So what does that mean? It means every month they take a share of their revenue, more than $150,000, and donate it to incredible progressive organizations like Friends of the Earth, Project Vote, Social Security Works, the Brennan Center for Justice. Even better, Credo lets people vote every month to determine how they divide this pool of funding. Not only does Credo fund progressive causes, but you get to use the phone of your choice with great service. Right now, Credo has a special deal for Randy Roadshow listeners. Go to Credo.com com slash randy and get 150 dollars off any smartphone of your choice plus 50 percent off unlimited talk and text for one year just go to credo.com slash randy credo.com slash randy credo.com slash randy or call 1-888-533-8225 and tell them randy from the randy road show sent you the phone company that represents your values credo.com slash randy <laughs> You're listening to Win Workers Independent News, a production of Diversified Media Enterprises. I'm Doug Cunningham. The Chicago Teachers Union is urging Mayor Rahm Emanuel to stop eliminating nurses, social workers, psychologists, and counselors. As the union entered its second day of a strike authorization vote, teachers said that students impacted by violence and poverty need good crisis intervention provided by these workers who are being cut. The Chicago Teachers Union says the Chicago Public Schools has been cutting the number of certified nurses in the schools for years. CTU Vice President Jesse Sharkey said these nurses and other clinicians provide vital services to students at a time when the city is under siege by gun violence, violent crime, poverty, and cuts to social services programs. Results of the strike authorization vote will be announced by the Chicago Teachers Union next week after several more days of voting. The Fight for 15 workers' movement is planning a major protest combined with a fast food worker strike at the first presidential general election debate on Monday. New York fast food cooks and cashiers will strike as their brothers and sisters at airports and home care and child care work join the call for $15 an hour and union rights. Fight for 15 says that there will be a massive march on Hofstra University by underpaid workers from across the East Coast. Thousands are expected to join the protest at the presidential debate on campus. 64 million workers make less than $15 an hour in America, and Fight for 15 is trying to mobilize as many of them as possible to vote in November. Workers have scored several victories lately in collective bargaining actions. Among them are Long Island University faculty busting a lockout against them with student and other labor support. Detroit teachers winning wage increases. Workers at two Florida newspapers voting to join the News Guild CWA. Magna seating workers in Tennessee overwhelmingly voting to join the UAW. Workers at Lipton's Tea Factory voting to join the UFCW. And more NBC Universal workers voting to unionize with the Writers Guild of America East. Brought to you by the Alliance for American Manufacturing, working to prevent the loss of American jobs caused by unfair foreign competition, and working to promote fair trade laws to level the playing field for American workers. Information on how you can help create smart, worker-focused public policy is online at AmericanManufacturing.org. Brought to you by UnionJobs.com, posting jobs for unions, socially allied, and community organizations since 1997. Workers Independent News puts workers and their unions on the national radio news airwaves every day. 
To help keep Labor's voice on the air, go to laborradio.org. Workers Independent News is proud to be heard on The Union Edge, Labor's talk radio. Live nationwide weekdays, noon to 3 p.m. at theunionedge.com. You've been listening to Win Workers Independent News. For more information, visit laborradio.org. Hi, we're back, and everything is possible again. Isn't it beautiful? Well, if you want to keep it this way, buy a stinking podcast. Oh, yes, you have to buy a stinking podcast. And you get that at randyroads.com, where we're open all day, all night long. randyroads.com. Get your stinking podcast. On the eve of the most important election of our time, bring your friends to an unprecedented event. The Sexy Liberal Tour goes coast to coast. Give it up for yourselves, Sexy Liberals. God bless you. I want to be listening. Monday, November 7th, just one night. We've got to protect our phony baloney job, gentlemen. The Sexy Liberal Comedy Tour comes to your town. It's a special Get Out the Vote rally with a new original show in theaters nationwide on the eve of the election. What would you like to see a new government bring in? Uh, more wine. You've told your friends about it. Now show them what Sexy Liberal is all about. Stephanie Miller, John Fugelsang, and comedy duo Frangela are eager to make you laugh and get out the vote. The Sexy Liberal Show and Fathom Events make it possible for the number one political comedy tour to come to your city with this one-of-a-kind event at Select Cinemas Nationwide, Monday, Election Eve, November 7th. For more information and tickets, visit FathomEvents.com. There's still a world left when this is all over. I'd like to buy you a beer. Oh, my. My God. Mary, how does the man, man, man? The fault. We believe that all men are created equal. To the magnificent mosaic that is America. From radio beacon to radio beacon. I have a dream. Change has come to America. Believe me. Knock, knock. Who's there? It's a figment of your imagination. Randy Rhodes Show. Turn up your mind. A lot of people have asked me what I think about Black Lives Matter. Well, put simply, I think that they do. Goddamn. Don't shoot him. Don't shoot him. He has no weapon. He has no weapon. Don't shoot him. Don't shoot him. Don't shoot him. He didn't do anything. He doesn't have a gun. He has a TBI. He's not going to do anything to you guys. He just took his medicine. Keith, don't let them break the windows. Come on out the car. He's in the car. Keith, don't do it. Keith, get out the car. Keith, Keith, don't you do it. Don't you do it. Keith, Keith. Kate, don't you do it! Did you shoot him? Did oh you shoot him? Did you shoot him? He better not be f-ing dead. He better not be f-ing dead. I know that f-ing much. I know that much. He better not be dead. I'm not gonna come near you. I'm gonna record though. Oh. I'm not coming near you. I'm gonna record though. He better be alive because I'm coming. You better. That's it. Oh, I swear to God. I- don't want to lose it, but it's, I'm so close to losing it. I'm so close. Every day. Every day. Every day. He's not going to hurt you. He doesn't have a gun. Keith, get get out of the car. He's in the car. And they're screaming, drop the gun. Drop the effing gun. Whoever bleeped that did a terrible job because it's all in there. That was I uh, got that off of CNN, but uh, they didn't bleep it very well, and I'm glad they didn't because he's screaming, "Get the, get, drop the fucking gun!" There is no gun. He's sitting in the car. His wife is on the car. Did you even? I didn't even know his wife was there until she released the cell phone video. They're waiting for their kids. They have seven kids, seven children. Here's the lawyer Eduard, Eduardo Curry for the Scott family. Uh, saying what he saw on the dash cam video. I was there, I saw the video, and there was nothing defended that would show me that there was a weapon in the hands of Mr. Scott. In fact, it shows a confused man 
who's befuddled, surely scared, who's stepping back away from who he perceives to be a threat, and then he was shot and killed with his hands down in a non-aggressive manner. Mr. Scott was befuddled. Mr. Scott was obviously scared. Mr. Scott did not know what to do in that exact one-minute segment of time. He had just taken medicine for his traumatic brain injury. That's what his wife said. He was sitting at the bus stop in his car. So was she with him waiting for the kids to come home from school four o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, they start screaming why they were interested in him. I still don't know. Do you, does any? did I miss a memo? Did I miss some newsy, newsy news report? Did some news model spew it out that I didn't get? Because I don't even know why they even went near him. They were serving a warrant on somebody else. I don't even understand it. However, they descend upon him. He's confused. He's befuddled. He's scared of the police, as any black man in America today would be with this history, with this every day, every day. And he doesn't know what to do. He's backing away. His arms are down at his side after he gets out of the car. And he's confused and scared. And they shoot him. And there'll be another one. There'll be another one next week. And there'll be another, uh, there'll be probably two more next week. And there will be two more the week before. And there will be two more the week after that. And two more and two more. And you know, I don't know, uh, Lester Holt's going to moderate this big, uh, you know, thing, this debatey thing on Monday, Monday night. And uh, I've seen his topics. It's like securing America and the economy. You think this might come up? I'm hoping it comes up. All right, 561-270-3844. That story about the uh, the, the, the white supremacists, uh, you know, uh, uh, why don't they, in, infiltrating the uh, police department, if you just started listening, I would say buy this podcast and listen to this show in its entirety so you can follow what we just laid out for you with regard to thousands of police officers just in one city, just in San Francisco, where the police chief has become the district attorney responsible for holding the police accountable for their crimes. Yeah, that'll happen. Uh, a thousand cases of white supremacists uh, texting each other on the police force. Cases of torturing confessions out of people. Cases of, uh, well, Betty, I, I told you I'd tell you about Betty Shelby. Betty Shelby, who killed Mr. Crutcher the other day. You know, uh, her husband was also a police officer in Tulsa. He happened to be in the helicopter that day. Now, we'll say the way that Tulsa responded and the way that Charlotte is responding are two. It's day and night. It's day and night. And you wouldn't expect it in, a, in Oklahoma, but we're getting it in Oklahoma. We're getting, you know, uh, uh, the videos from Oklahoma uh, almost immediately. We're getting the tapes, the audio tapes from Oklahoma almost immediately. And they've already um, uh, indicted Betty Shelby for manslaughter in Oklahoma. Now, the thing about Betty Shelby is because now that she was... Uh, you know, charged with manslaughter, uh, they, everybody wants to know who she is and, and look into her background. And that's exactly what happened today. Uh, the Huffington Post decided to take it upon themselves to look into her background. And it's pretty interesting. This is the, 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 the female officer who killed Terrence Gretcher that, that Donald Trump had problems with, which is probably why something happened so fast, so fast. Because the previous uh, officer in Tulsa who killed Eric Harris who was also an unarmed black kid, uh, he wasn't really an officer. He was, uh, he was a pay-to-play officer, meaning he played golf with the police chief in Tulsa. And so this 74-year-old real estate executive was deputized and allowed to harass black people with a gun. And uh, he thought that they would have his back, but apparently, no, not so much. Got to be a union member, apparently, to get have your back gotten. But anyway, Betty Shelby in Tulsa, she was charged yesterday, right? And so uh, her husband was in the helicopter that day. He's not the one who said he looks like a bad dude, which was a big tip off that they had a problem. But at least we got to hear the video. But uh, apparently she's been divorced and remarried at least once. Okay, big deal. But it turns out that her ex-husband's new wife had filed a protective order against her in 2002 
to get her to stop harassing the new wife. Betty Shelby was harassing the new wife with phone calls and, uh, you know, the new wife claimed. Um, but they denied her order of protection. They denied uh, that to her. And uh, Betty Shelby has maintained her innocence, uh, saying, I never harassed her. Then 10 years later, Betty Shelby was dating some guy and they broke up. That guy also sought a restraining order against Betty Shelby after her boyfriend and her exchanged violence with each other, damaging each other's cars in some way. So temporary restraining orders were filed and then eventually, uh, you know, um, thrown out. So there's two instances of two people trying to get restraining orders against Betty Shelby, but the court keeps throwing it out, right? And then, of course, you have um, on her application to become a uh, police officer, she, she came from the Tulsa County Sheriff's Office and joined the Tulsa Police Force in 2011. Uh, coming from the sheriff's office. And, and on her application, um, she noted the various uh, d uh, domestic disturbances and she marked yes under the prompt that asked whether she had possessed and used illegal drugs in the past. And when they asked her what illegal drugs have you used in the past, she said, oh, I smoked pot twice when I was 18. Yeah, sure. Even I, who do not smoke pot, smoke more pot than that when I was 18. And then the two excessive force complaints uh, against her. It's, I mean, this is just, I don't, I don't know. Where, where are we getting these police officers? Where, are we, what are we, I mean, honest to God. I, I will tell you that, you know, when, um, when, when disturbances happened, uh, I guess people, uh, who was it that said, uh, oh, if you don't like the police, why don't you put in an application and, and become a police officer? I guess that was in Dallas, right? That the, that Dallas police chief, he's resigned. So, well, he didn't resign. That's a that's a poor way to put it. He retired. He retired. This whole epidemic uh, of, uh, you know, uh, police shooting uh, unarmed black men and having to defend it as a black man. I think it was very emotional for him. I think the whole thing and his officers then being uh, retaliated. I think it was too much. And he retired. But before he retired, he said, if you don't like it, why don't you guys, you black black kids, why don't you put it? You know, he got 500 applications to join the Dallas Police Department. Yeah, 500 people. All right, let's see what we got here. Uh, Tamara in Joplin, Missouri. Hello, Randy. Hi, Tamara. 20 years ago, I worked for a lady whose son was a sheriff. And he came walking into the flower shop one day in shorts and a T-shirt, covered in swastika Nazi tattoos. Oh, that's a good look. And I said to him, I said, does the sheriff's office know you've got Nazi tattoos? Because, you know, I'm a liberal and I'll speak up. And he says, oh, we all have them. <laughs> and I just about okay. died. Okay, let's just cut to the. Why don't we make the pointy hood part of the uniform? Just get it over with. <laughs> and a couple years later, he, he was fired from the sheriff's department and got into a shootout with him, and they ended up shooting him in the stomach, and he did a couple of years in jail. Oh, nice. Oh, that, and it, good result. It's like, <laughs> That's the, the, yeah. the Southern Poverty Law Center yeah. raised the red flag 30 years ago. Yeah, they did. That white supremacists and KKK were moving into police departments all over the country. Yeah, well, now the FBI has finally, you know, gotten involved. And uh, it looks to me as if from 2000, I mean, the, the first report was issued in 2006 saying be on the lookout, okay, a bolo for white supremacists infiltrating police. But in 2000, from 2008 to 14, the last, uh, the last look that we could get, uh, the amount of white supremacists on police forces has increased exponentially. And so we're all yes. sitting here scratching our heads and other, other various body parts, trying to, you know, uh, wanting to defend the police, wanting to defend people who risk their lives for us because we admire people who do that kind of brave thing. But now yes, we, we know do. what the freaking problem is. Those police officers who are serving and protecting for real are having to serve next to white supremacists and the police chiefs who 
know all about this are becoming the district attorneys and they are protecting the infiltration of the police force by people like Mark Furman, like this guy you just described, and knowing, knowing that they uh, hold and, and really will mark their bodies up with, uh, you know, 14 and 88 and all the freaking Nazi swastikas stickers and all the little clues that, uh, you know, show that they are, uh, you know, wanting to join to get paid to have a gun and beat up or harass or kill black people. It's disgusting. So, you know, when you look at it and you start to figure it out and you say, okay, so, so. If this, because, you know, who the hell are we, right? But if this is something the FBI is warning about, and if this is something that's actually happening, and if this is something that's infesting our police departments and causing black men to show up dead all over the country twice a week, and if you have little 13-year-old boys where they're shooting to kill only to find out they have BB guns or water guns or toy guns or Skittles or iced tea. Then we know what the problem is and we can go about solving it. But why there's no leadership? How could these reports be out there all this time? And there's been no response from any of these police departments other than I'll start a task force. How is that possible in a country that prides itself on equal justice for all? You know, these kooks on the on the right, they want to say, uh, oh, First Amendment, I get to, you know, uh, I get to say whatever I get to smear you. Yeah, you do. Second Amendment, I get to carry a gun. Fine. But there are other things like equal justice under law. For a commercial free, on demand, whenever, wherever listening experience, visit randyrhodes.com for your personal premium podcast today. With the Dow rallying back to recent highs, everything looks good on the surface. But the underlying data is saying something very different. Experts are saying another recession may be on the horizon. And if Trump wins the election, who knows how bad things will get. Are you comfortable with Trump holding the keys to America's economic future? Well, hell no. He scares the crap out of me. So there's something that we all need to do. Protect yourselves. My friends at ITM Trading teach people how to use gold and silver as wealth protection in uncertain economic times. They make owning gold and silver a very simple process, and they even ship it right to your door absolutely free. So call my friends at ITM Trading at one triple eight own gold and ask them to send you a free gold kit. It outlines how to protect yourself with gold and silver. Learn what you need to. Get started today. ITM Trading. Call them at one triple eight own gold one triple eight o w n g o l d and protect yourself today tell them randy sent you hey guys ron placone here vp nominee mike pence said that dick cheney is his role model leaving us all to wonder will he take donald trump quail hunting speaking of which wisconsin governor scott walker will be playing the role of tim kane to help mike pence get ready for the vice presidential debates Scott Walker is very excited. The last time he got to act was when he had to give a slightly positive speech to the Wisconsin Board of Education. Now over on the other side, Tim Kaine is trying to find somebody to play Mike Pence so that he can practice for the debates. However, they realize they're not going to get their first choice upon finding out that Hannibal Lecter was not a real person. And Gary Johnson vows to keep fighting and says that his goal is to be in the second presidential debate. Man, I bet that guy had the worst NCAA bracket ever. I got Louisville losing in the Sweet 16 and then I have them winning the tournament. What? What's wrong with that? That works, right? Isn't that cool? That, that, that's not copacetic? I don't, I, don't, I don't understand. How? A Fox News poll says that Trump is unqualified to be president. Fox News. That's like Boston.com saying the New England Patriots are their least favorite football team. That's like the Olive Garden saying their worst item is breadsticks. That's like Playboy saying they don't think Hugh Hefner has as much sex as he says he does. Alright, sorry, I shouldn't compare Playboy to Fox News. One actually publishes real articles, the other is Fox News. This is Ron Placone, signing out.
You can check me out on the web at ronplacone.com. Again, that is Ron, P as in Paul, L-A-C-O-N-E dot com. And this is Ron Placone for the Indie Bohemians. You are listening to the Progressive Voices Network. Clear for takeoff. Randy Rhodes Air Force. Air Force. Air Force. Randy Rhodes dot com. We're going to rebuild our inner cities because our African-American communities are absolutely in the worst shape that they've ever been in before, ever, ever, ever. You take a look at the inner cities, you get no education, you get no jobs, you get shot walking down the street. They're worse. I mean, honestly, places like Afghanistan are safer than some of our inner cities. And I say to the African-American communities, and I think it's resonating, because you see what's happening with my poll numbers with African-Americans. They're going, like, high. Um, In in Donald Trump's uh, um, fevered dream, in Donald Trump's scary, scary little uh, mind, black communities are bleak and dangerous war zones. Except that is not true. And if there's a war going on in this country, then there has to be two sides. And the dead people that are showing up seem to be young African Americans all over the place. Now, I went and looked up whether or not Donald Trump was right, that crime was through the roof, through the roof, that people can't walk down the street without getting shot. And, um, you know, none of that is true. Crime rates in uh, uh, America, uh, teen pregnancy rates for black Americans, crime rates for black Americans, high school graduation rates for black Americans, they have exponentially improved. I I, I don't even know where he's getting it. In 1992, 13.7% of African Americans dropped out of high school. Now 7.4% drop out of high school. Same thing with whites. Pregnancy, black uh, teenage mothers, 1990, 120 uh, black, uh, young black teens had babies out of a thousand. Every, every thousand had 120. Now 34 out of a thousand. 1980, unemployment in the African American community was 14.3%. Today it's 9.5, still too high, but definitely trending downward. 21 African Americans per 100,000 were shot in 1999 and now 17 per 100,000. Still too high, but the trend is the opposite of what Donald Trump says. So why is Donald Trump doing this? Well, it's so interesting to me that while homicides among uh, black Americans are at historic lows and more black students are graduating from high school and unemployment among black Americans is dropping, Not to say that African-Americans don't disproportionately suffer from substandard schools or substandard policing or poverty, but black communities certainly are not these urban hell holes that uh, Trump portrays in his speeches. But then you look at Donald Trump's speeches to white people about their underachievement, about their inability to make a living, about their inability to graduate high school, about their inability to be married before they have children. And what does he tell white voters? He says, your problems are the result of a rigged system. So white people suffer from a rigged system, but black people suffer from Well, you're going to have to listen to a Trump supporter to find out what she thinks. Uh, Most of the people who are what they say crossing over supporting Mr. Trump are all older. I think they're over 60 for the most part. Any African-Americans? Well, that's a smaller percentage of our population, and I don't think that many. I'm sure there were some, but I don't know if they were voting. I mean, I'm talking about voters. What's your response to people who say that there is a... A, a just below the surface level of racism in America and Donald Trump's candidacy has enabled that to just slip above the surface. 
I don't think there was any racism until Obama oh got elected. Oh my God! That we never had problems like this. You know, I, I'm in the real estate industry. There's none. Now, you know, with the people with the guns and shooting up neighborhoods and not being responsible citizens, that's a big change. And I think that's the philosophy that Obama has perpetuated on America. I think that's all his responsibility. And if you're black and you haven't been successful in the last 50 years, it's your own fault. But empirically speaking, if you're born with black skin in this country, you have a disadvantage over someone born with white no, skin. I think you had a real advantage over it because you had all the um, advantages going to college. You had, adva you had all of the advantages because they got into schools without the same oh grades as a white kid. So I, I think that when we look at the last 50 years, where are we and why? We have three generations of all still having unwed babies, kids that don't go through high school. I mean, when do they take responsibility for how they live? I think it's due time, and I think that's good that Mr. Trump is pointing that out. So, okay, that, that, that's Kathy Miller, who was uh, the chair of the uh, Mahoney County uh, Donald Trump election committee. She has resigned because the county chair for the GOP uh, said that he had contacted the Trump campaign asking for Miss Miller to be dismissed over her insane comments. Now, if insane comments are a cause for dismissal, what happens to Donald Trump? Who says the most insane crap? Like, whites are underachieving because of a rigged system, but blacks are underachieving because they're black. And what is this woman going to do now? I guess she'll teach at Trump University. I don't. I don't know what else she could possibly do with her life. But listen, this is this is the the, the dirty little trick that um, that Donald Trump is playing. He's stereotyping African Americans in such a crude and lewd way, in such a a, a bizarre way, and he's doing it under the guise of faux concern, right? Oh, I'm on your side. I care for you. This is just exactly like in 1837. Uh, you had South Carolina Senator John C. Calhoun, who defended slavery this way. Never before has the black race of Central Africa from the dawn of history to the present day attained a condition so civilized and so improved, not only physically, but morally and intellectually. That's what Donald Trump is saying. Donald Trump is saying blacks need his help, and he's here to help. It's Bill O'Reilly, slaves were well fed and taken care of, okay? This is the same thing Richard Nixon with his law and order meme, okay? Richard Nixon was like, well, we have to help the black people because they can't help themselves. They're drug addled, and they're, uh, they're, they're teenage pregnancies, and they're, you know, they just don't know what they're doing. They need the white man, and I'm the white man. And then you had in 67, the assistant attorney general in Virginia, uh, General R.D. McIlwain III, he based his defense on interracial marriage, okay? He, 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 he was for the ban on interracial marriage. Remember um, Loving versus Virginia? That was the case where a black, a black woman and a, and a white man got married and uh, they, they went to court. And uh, so the attorney general argued against interracial marriage by saying, well, you got to worry about the children, don't you? So he said uh, interracial marriage is bequeathed to the progeny of those marriages, much more psychological problems than parents have a right to bequeath to children. So you see what they do? They stereotype the result and then they say, but I'm here to protect you from that. 1953, John W. Davis, the attorney who defended school segregation. You know, we know Brown versus Board, but we don't realize that there were attorneys on the other side arguing for segregation. And his argument in South Carolina was he was convinced that the happiness and the welfare of the little black school children was best promoted in their own school, separate but equal. This is what Donald Trump is saying to white people. And, you know, the idea that he's doing so well among African-Americans, he's not doing so well, but he has increased the, the percentage. I looked at Real Clear Politics average. I know a lot of, uh, you know, websites where I don't really put much faith, but I know a lot of websites are saying he's not doing great with African-Americans. Well, there's truth to that, but he's doing better since he started this faux concern for African-Americans. Uh, I looked at the Re Real Clear Politics average, um, African-Americans, Trump is now at 
among African Americans. Hillary Clinton is at 72.5% support. However, Obama had, if you'll remember, 93% of the African American community supporting him and 95% in 2012. Hillary only has 72%. And uh, that's a problem. And the same thing in Hispanic uh, in the Hispanic polls I looked um Clinton's got 63.6% of uh, support from Hispanics, but Trump has 25% from Hispanics. Obama 71 and 67 percent so whatever donald trump is doing is resonating with some people but that's because we don't ever discuss the real cause and effect we don't ever really discuss what equal justice under law means in this country or how you go about getting it we never ever talk about I mean, we, some people talk about the, the recent history. They'll talk about separate but equal. They'll talk about Jim Crow. They'll talk about, because a lot of people in this audience are a little older and they remember school busing and they remember the first steps towards integration and they remember that black kids had to get up at 4.30 in the morning to be bused clear across town to white schools in the name of desegregation and they were exhausted by the time school started at 8 o'clock in the morning or 7.30 in the morning. Uh, and I, you know, uh, some people remember the, the beginnings of, of fixing some of these problems were very bumpy and difficult uh, roads. But there's too many people in this country that do and, and too many people in positions of power with platforms that make this one look stupid. OK, who reach a million people a day, which is what you have to reach to be a superstar in media. OK, we're, we're still at about 100,000, my friends. We got to do better. So you have to subscribe to the YouTube page, costs nothing. It's like liking me on Facebook, same thing. And you have to purchase the podcast so I can hire somebody who understands this world in which we're toiling. That's the next person I want to hire is somebody who understands this internet thing a whole lot better than Paul and I do. I'm, I provide the content and Paul provides the, all the technical support, but as far as the, 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 the guts of the internets, we need to hire somebody and that's the next person. And, the, and then I need to hire a salesperson as well to take the burden off of you. Because I want to sell Super Beats and I want to sell Tiger Lady <laughs> and pay the bills with that. All right, but I digress. There are people who have a million people listening to them every single day who can at just as easily as I can, research the infiltration of this police force with white supremacists who can look at police chiefs who then become the district attorney or prosecutors who get elected based on police union support who never will prosecute a police officer simply because they took the police union money. Okay, this is the systemic problem and nobody wants to discuss it, but they will scream and yell all day long that something's wrong and maybe Donald Trump's right. No, he's not right. He's pandering and he's doing it to make suburban and ex-urban white women feel okay about voting for a racist. A white supremacist is trying to take the presidency. Larry in Lake Elsinore. Hello, Randy. Hi, where's my package of foods? Well, it's, according to uh, the Postal Service, it arrived yesterday. Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, I sent it to the address you gave me. <laughs> well, first oh. you sent it to my old Clear Channel. Uh, yeah, I know. I felt so, bad and, about that. Yeah, so everybody in at Clear Channel, where Rush Limbaugh toils, uh, they all got your delicious uh, cookies and cakes. Well, I tell you, <laughs> maybe, maybe, I hope they didn't deliver to the wrong address, but I copied the one you gave me exactly, so... Worst case scenario, I'll have to make up another batch. <laughs> okay, well, that's what you'll do. Yeah, I will, I will. So anyway, um, you know, I remember the Watts riot. Yeah. I, you know, I'm 65, so I remember watching it on TV. The exact channel was KTLA, and they're the one of the few people that had a telecopter. And it's the same thing then that it is now. Yeah. Nothing has changed. Well, you know what's changed? What's changed is the radicalization of the white men in this country after the election of Barack Obama. When you can see reports that there were always Ku Klux Klan serving in the police forces and people in the South are real clear that their sheriff was probably wearing a sheet on Saturday night and burning a cross. OK, everybody gets that. Everybody knows that. However, the exponential increase in white supremacy identity in this country has increased exponentially since the election of Barack Obama.
Oh, and I don't, and I don't question that. But what I'm saying is, is that you know the, these situations with the police departments and such has been going on for such a long time. And you're right. You know, I remember that report that you were talking about, where there, you know, it's mentioned about how the KKK and the white supremacists were going to get uh, and infiltrate the police departments. I do remember that report. But I see so much of this today, and I'm thinking to myself, you know, these Americans out there who call themselves Americans, who call themselves patriots, who turn around and they they talk. About about the Constitution, these people are idiots because they haven't got a freaking clue. No, they're Germans. And, and, and they're, they're, the, they're, they're, the, they're World War II era Germans. They're, they're, the, they're the same people that talk about how great this country is and this is the best country to live in, but they haven't stepped one foot out of this country to see how other countries are. Well, that's and another just, thing. That's another thing is that, uh, you know, how what's the percentage of Americans who own passports who have ever gone to Germany who, who think that, you know, uh, the 30s, Germany and the 30s was the, the most ideal place and the purging of Jews and the purging of, uh, you know, anybody that was brown and gays and all that should occur here. You know, if they ever went to Germany, they would see and could talk to the people who live through it who will say that either they were on the wrong side of history and they regret it and to this day they carry this horrendous guilt, at you know, in their old age or... Or they will talk to people who, uh, you know, uh, supported it and, uh, you know, are still trying to uh, recreate it who are being put in prison for it. Yeah, but we got a we got a guy, this guy, Donald Trump, not Trump, Trump, because that's what he is. He's not a chump. He's not a chump. He's he's not a chump, Larry. His vote should be. He's not. His voters are. His voters are. His voters are being punked. His voters are being. I get that, Randy, but but I'm, I just call him that because he doesn't deserve to be called by a regular name. But the guy, the guy is he. he it was stated in Ivanka's book how he used to uh, go to sleep at night before going to sleep. He would read famous speeches by by Nazi uh, 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 officers and not people in the, in the Nazi party. I mean, this is a guy who's not only a Nazi, but he's a racist too. And, and you know, everybody glosses over the fact that he's 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 the one that and his father have have made sure that black people couldn't rent uh, uh, apartments or, or any housing through through them. I mean, the guy is is disgusting. And yeah, yet but you know, you know what about following him? You know what about? Uh, yeah, I agree. Anybody that that is supporting him is uh, enabling bigotry and hatred and uh, racism. However, there are people that are for that, and those people, you know, as as much as I can't understand why they hate so hard, uh, I understand that they would support him because he's he's talking in code to them. Uh, you know, every time he says eighty eight generals, or you know, uh, I mean, all the all the you know, his son tweets the skittles. Thing. I mean, he's he's talking to them, and I get that he's talking to them. But I don't understand the the decent people who do make a, you know a nice living who are supporting him. Uh, they don't seem to think that they are enabling and supporting racism, and they are. Oh, there's some of them are, are enamored by his so-called wealth, and we don't know what that really is. Uh, but. They're enamored by that, and they, you know, it's like the people that that are Republicans who are poor. They seem to think somehow the wealth is going to rub off onto them, and they always vote against their better interests. We not only have Trump that's running for president, who's a Nazi racist. We've got people in Congress, and I've never, ever yet heard a racist admit that he's a racist. That's true. And they're all, they're, you know, these, these Republicans. The only, the the only member of, of the Senate or the House that I ever saw admit that he was a racist was, um, uh, what's his, that old senator that was a, 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 a Ku Klux Klan member. Oh, yeah, right, from, from, the, from Carolina, uh, Thurman. South Carolina, I think Strom- it was. Thurman. Yeah, I know who you're talking about. My mind's gone blank. Mine Strom- too. Thurman. Yeah, yeah Strom Thurmond. Uh, right. Well, Strom Thurmond and, and Bird. Oh, that's what I was thinking of. Robert Byrd. Right. Right. Not right. Strom Thurmond. He, he was a Republican and he went to the Democratic side. Well, Strom Thurmond, uh, not Strom Thurmond, uh, Robert Byrd was a uh, Grand Kliegel or I don't know, the Grand Wizard or some magical thing uh, with the Ku Klux Klan. And he renounced them uh, like in the 60s and then uh, moved over to the Democratic Party. And that that 
is one of Hillary Clinton's mentors because I think what she admired about him is that he could admit that he had been an ugly, racist, bigoted, hateful white supremacist, renounced it and went on to do really good things with his life. Why are we breaking at 44? All right, uh, 44 after. Call in, connect. To speak to Randy, call 561-270-3844. 561-270-3844. Attention men under the age of 35. You know what really impresses the ladies? When a guy has a few drinks and later gets pulled over for buzz driving. That could cost you around $10,000 in fines, legal fees, and increased insurance rates. There goes let's grab dinner and a movie. Oh, I know. You drive more carefully when you're buzzed. You've proven that hundreds of times. A woman admires that kind of confidence. And you've practiced how to speak if a cop does pull you over. Slowly, clearly, and politely like, good evening, officer. A woman admires that kind of foresight. And what woman doesn't find it adorable that you call it buzzed even though the law calls it drunk? You could kiss $10,000 goodbye, along with any chance of having a girlfriend. Because nothing says, I'm a catch, more than a guy who lives in his parents' basement and calls it my place. Buzzed, busted, and broke. Because buzz driving is drunk driving. A message from the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration and the Ad Council. I am super sexually satisfied. I'm genuinely 100% more satisfied with my sex life than I was before Randy Rhodes came back on the air. Hi, I'm the Howard, and yes, it's true. I'm actually 100% more sexually satisfied than I was just one day ago. And I didn't grow a mustache. I didn't get an awesome new tattoo, and I didn't join a CrossFit gym either. I just bought a Randy Rhodes Air Force t-shirt. And when I did, I told Randy, Well, there, I've done my part. How do I look at my awesome new Randy Rhodes Air Force 100% super soft cotton tee? And Randy said, that's it? That's all you did to support this unfreaking, unbelievably hard effort? Okay, Howard, go fuck yourself. So I did. And I have to tell you, I still got it. Get your super soft Randy Rhodes t-shirt at randyrhodes.com. Just click on podcasts and swag and order yours today. You'll feel a lot better after you tell Randy. The Randy Rhodes Show is brought to you by our partners at ITM Trading. Call them at one own gold and ask for a free gold kit. one o w n g o l d All things Randy at randyrhodes.com. Go, go for long. Speaking truth to power, The Randy Rhodes Show. Well, one of the things I'd do, Ricardo, is uh, I would do stop and frisk. I think you have to. We did it in New York. It worked incredibly well. And you have to be proactive. And, you know, you, you really help people sort of change their mind automatically. You understand. You, you have to have, in my opinion, I see what's going on here. I see what's going on in Chicago. I think stop and frisk. In New York City, it was so incredible the way it worked. Now, we had a very good mayor, but New York City was incredible the way that worked. So I think that would be one step you could do. You know, he's so full of crap. First of all, he's, a, he's, he's alleging that the mayor uh, that, that was so great was uh, Rudy Giuliani. Stop and frisk was a policy of Michael Bloomberg, who has called Donald Trump a con man and a fraud. He's also a multi, multi-millionaire. Bloomberg. And he knows the circles that Donald Trump uh, runs in. And, uh, you know, it's so interesting to me that Donald Trump's solution to what's going on on our streets is never to look at the distrust of the police. I read you stories yesterday, and if you're a podcast subscriber, go listen to yesterday, too. I told you stories yesterday of people calling the police to help them out with their own family members, only to end up being killed by the police responding after three and four phone calls going, please help us, please help us. Those same people that are calling for help are the ones that are being shot and killed by police. So people don't call the police in Chicago. People don't trust the police in Chicago. And I've just shown you why when I read you Mr. Burge's story where they torture suspects into confessing to crimes they didn't do. So, 
you have residents of a city who distrust the police so so much. And and the the latest example, Rahm Emanuel did the most horrible thing, and Charlotte's mayor is doing the same damn thing. Release the damn video, okay? Let the people see. But Laquan McDonald, who was you remember Laquan McDonald? He was the kid that spun around in the middle of the road on the video. Okay, Laquan McDonald's video wasn't released to the public for a whole year, causing all kinds of problems in Chicago. But Donald Trump never talks about that. Donald Trump never talks about, well, there is a a distrust of the police, and here's why. And these are the things we have to tackle, and this is what I want to look at. There are white supremacists who are joining uh, local police forces, and there are there are, there is a number of uh, you know uh, uh, problems that the black community has with distrusting the police, and that has to do with their training or whatever he's going to say. But no, no, what he does is he paints a picture of of a war torn, bleak, dismal, you know, a uh, 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 fucked up place, and says I'm the only one that can solve it, and the way to solve it is to racially profile the same people who are being shot dead for no reason especially when they call for help. Remember two of the cases that we talked about yesterday and today were people whose car had broken down. Mr. Crutcher in Tulsa, his car was stalled in the middle of the road. Ended up dead. Corey Jones here in Florida. He was a drummer coming home from a a gig. I don't know if it was a wedding or what it was. Four o'clock in the morning, his car broke down. Also undercover cops. An undercover cop approached him, shot him, and then called it in as if he, the cop was currently being threatened and that man, Corey Jones, was already dead. Of course there's distrust, but, you know, we'll never get a conversation about that out of any any Republican ever. David in New York. Hey, Randy, calling live from the streets of New York City. Hey. Is it a hey, war- I was just calling to tell how's, you about... How's my um, hometown? Is it a war zone or what? No, you know what? Actually, the weather's beautiful. The cars are moving. People are saying hello. It's, it's okay. We're okay. We're doing good here. I know. It's great. Yeah. Well, I was just calling to tell you about a relationship. I had a police officer for about two years, and he was new to the force very late in life. I think he joined around 37, not 35. Anyways, the B cops he was working with send nothing but these racist uh, memes, these racist messages, the conversations they're having on their cell phones are disgusting. If you've ever seen the police officers today, that's all they're doing is they're on their cell phones. And that's not all they're doing. They do a good job most of the time. But whatever conversation they're having among themselves is something really toxic. Yeah, really I, toxic. I know. I mean, when when you have the 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 public defender in San Francisco say that there are at least a thousand cases he found with one guy's cell phone, like you know, uh, tweeting and 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 texting uh, his fellow police officers, seven get fired, but you know, the seven lead to fourteen, and the, those those fourteen lead to twenty eight, and the, he said there are at least a thousand uh, uh, you know uh, police officers involved in this uh, white supremacist text messaging. And, you know, one of the things that, that could be done, I don't know, uh, is, is hold them, um, you know, hold them civilly responsible. Do you know what I mean? Like civil. Like, yeah. Well, you know what I mean? Like a, a doc- there. like a doctor serves the public, too. Right. A doctor will cure you of your cancer. Thank God they will do. Uh, but they have to have malpractice insurance because sometimes they, they hurt people, you know, inadvertently. And the court decides whether or not there was intent or neglect or, uh, you know, wrongful behavior. Was the doctor stoned or drunk or was he, you know, somehow responsible? Uh, same thing ought to happen with police. I think they might, uh, you know, police themselves a little bit better. Yeah, well, the problem is there's a union, and unfortunately, the union has the job of protecting shitty people. Yeah, I don't know but why that is. Well, but doc- I don't know why they're protecting awful people, but they do. But doctors, I mean, we had that cannibal cop, the guy who was talking but about doctors women. and lawyers also belong to associations, and they have to have malpractice insurance. Yeah, I don't know if it's any quick fix with anything like that, but there's, something's got to change. Well, that would be a good start, right? You are personally responsible for what you personally do while you're on the job. Uh, Rick in L.A. Hey, Randy, how's it going? All right. 
So it's almost beer o'clock for you. How about I know. that? I'm right? so excited. I can't even stand it. This week has been so, oh. it's been sad. It's been just so emotionally sad and oh, draining. Geez. Talking to a 51-year-old African-American man with an MBA who is scared to, to even get in his car. I mean, what kind of country is this? Yeah, it's not. Um, and, and, you know, our problems are all solvable. That's the that's the, yeah. the little cherry on the cake of this week is we can solve this with the right leadership. We could solve this with the right people in Congress. We could solve it with the right Supreme Court. We could solve all of this with the right yeah. with the right people in the right in the right jobs. But you, yeah, but we, we if we get the wrong people in the right jobs. Oh, geez. Holy crap, oh. man. I, I, well, look what happened to George W. Bush. How do we how, how do we do with that? Exactly. You know? Crash the economy. We yeah. went to a war with five trillion seven trillion dollars later we had a viceroy in freaking iraq uh, tortured yeah, people created yep. isis in the prisons of of, of abu Ghraib yep. and camp buka really yeah yeah not a good thing no. you know i sometimes wonder if we really didn't beat the nazis in world war ii if they just migrated over here to the u.s you know i mean with all of the white supremacist stuff going on and um you know just you know, it's out in the open now. No, yeah. these are Americans. You know? These are our own. These I are know. our homegrown little bastards. These are our homegrown haters. These are our homegrown bigots. These are these are older men who are recruiting younger kids and teaching them the traditional ways of daddy and grand grandpa and telling them, you know, join. You, you, you could get a gun. You can get paid to hunt black people. Uh, yeah, it's really vile. Uh, Yuki in San Francisco. Uh, uh, no, nah, I'm in Coconut Creek. <laughs> no, I don't know. That's how it came up. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, you're the second one that said that today. Anyway, um, I saw a <laughs> video of, <laughs> of a 15-year-old little, uh, little African-American gal, cute as a button, and these cops were, like, all over her. I mean, she, they handcuffed her, they threw her in the back of the police car. Oh, the girl on and, the bicycle that hit the car? Yeah. 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 No. And I'm thinking, you know, and the and the guy is pepper spraying in there. She's handcuffs. She's in there. Yeah. Why is he doing that? Yeah. And and well, and you know, I, you know what we saw on the TV, uh, just just to include everybody in this um, in this Uber uh, crazy policing that we see. Don't you remember when? Uh, I guess it was Occupy Wall Street. I'm wanting to say on college campuses, and all the kids were on their knees. Oh yeah. Yeah. And the police oh, yeah. walked like within inches of the of the faces of these kids and just pepper sprayed them all down the road with like an industrial sized canister of pepper spray. America watched it and just said, hey, that's got to stop and we're going to do absolutely nothing. <laughs> no, but the whole thing was she was afraid of the police because look at the environment they're giving to our young African-American kids. Well, that's a problem now, isn't it? When you think about solving crimes, what's the first thing you think about? Cooperation from the community that sees the crimes. But if the community doesn't trust the police because when they call for help, they end up dead, well, there's a breakdown in informants there's a breakdown of heads up there's a breakdown and this kid goes up and down the block every single day and uh, you know he's strapped and uh, he hangs out you know on the corner and he, he's you know vandalizing this or i saw him break into the liquor store they're not calling the cops they're not because they'll end up dead hey brother david sister i love you and i always will word to everything you've said all week especially today to the chat room very quickly. I invite all of you who have friends who don't listen to this show to ask 10 of them to subscribe to the YouTube channel, and we will see what happens. Okay, here's the thing, sister, here in the heartland. I know I've made the right choice. I was walking to Walgreen this morning to get whatever we needed for the house, and the little empty shop that's next to the Pa Affection Pet Salon is suddenly the Douglas County Republican Party. Vote no <laughs> on activist judges. Make America great again. He whom I refuse to name and the one who would really be president if he's elected. And I know that I made the right choice. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm working on a letter to HRHHRC. Whether she sees it or not, I cannot say. Right. But um, I'm totally with you. She needs to grab social media right now. Right now. Like she's never grabbed it before. I know. And do what you're doing on the, on the tubes and the Twitters and that. And do policy. And let POTUS you know, and FLOTUS and her running mate do that attack, except for the debates, of course. 
but she needs to grab it now. I know, and I, I've, I've asked. I've asked at the top, and they've referred me to the bottom, and the bottom says, oh, you need to look at the briefing. So I look at the briefing, and what's there? Is there audio <laughs> there? Is there video there? No, there's, there's transcripts of her on Steve Harvey show, which was such an important interview for her. Okay, Thank so, you. And instead of getting the audio, which I had to wait days to find, and okay, then somebody right, else right. aggregates it, and I get it from somebody else, and now I have it. But okay, and so then somebody else says, oh, no, she has a YouTube channel, so I go to the YouTube channel, and I'm like, well, where are the speeches? There's one speech, one yeah, she needs to step up the that rest, game, and this is the, the time rest, to do it. The rest of the stuff on the YouTube page is all her new commercials, which are great. No, 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 no. The commercials. They are great, but the but new no. one, we need to the see new her one with being the, presidential. The, the new one with the young girls looking into the mirror while Donald Trump says she's a fat pig, and you know, brilliant the, beyond belief. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a great ad, but that's not what you look for when you're no. looking for leadership. Okay. No, we need to see what she showed us at the, the at the convention. Well, I'm right serious. now, we, right now they're in very fierce de- debate prep. So so it won't be you won't hear anything until Monday night and then well and I've already got my popcorn ready yeah well you know what I, I, I got like I'm so scared to, to even have a sip of lemonade during that because spit takes will ensue now I can't drink because I got to work you know I don't drink during the week I only drink on Friday and Saturday but Monday night I'll have a little lemonade and it'll just Have a good weekend. (laughs) I forgot to say. Have a good weekend. Buy a stinking podcast. Love you.